Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's, uh, it's good to be here today. Um, I think the last time I was in my home ward, the third ward was, was in April. And so, sorry, this is kind of a hello and a goodbye all at once. Um, but I do have a love for this ward. It, it really is a ward family and that's credit due to all of its members here. I love the young men and the young men leaders. The bishop too, I, I look up to Bishop Beeler in many ways. I really do admire him. He's an example to me and I'm just glad I got to be a priest while he was bishop. That goes for all the bishopric as well. Um, I'm excited to get to Arizona and leave Canada for the winter and hopefully find a warmer refuge. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm, a, I'm excited to meet my companion, Elder Dell in the MTC this week, along with my district. Uh, this week of home MTC, I can honestly say that it has stretched me in ways I wasn't anticipating and that I, I never thought I would have grown as much as I have. And I am I'm truly grateful. truly grateful for this gospel and that the chance I have. I didn't expect to cry, especially not at the beginning. Um, but I'm just grateful for this gospel and the chance I have to learn it and then share it and teach it. Uh, uh, I've, I've looked forward to being a missionary for a long time. It, it really did start in primary when a couple of elders were teaching a Sunday school lesson. However, back then, through the eyes of a primary kid, it seemed as though missionaries were just two dudes who went home to home, got fed by good ward members, and just got to preach the gospel, a little vacation. But after this week of home MTC, I can testify that it is going to be more than a vacation. Um, I'm very eager to get started. Oh, jeez. And so I've been thinking about this farewell talk for a long time now, really since I've opened my mission call. It's always been in the back of my mind and throughout the couple months I've just been thinking of things to involve in it and put in it. Um, and so when my dad came up to me, talking to me about my talk, I knew he was going to assign me a topic. And I was prepared to say, no, it's okay, Dad, I've been working on it. I think I know what I'm going to speak on. I'll just choose my own topic. But the topic he gave me, I instantly loved. And I was like, that's definitely what I'm going to talk about. And so my topic today is um, on why God requires sacrifice. And as I pondered that question, and as I thought about it, prayed about it, and studied it, I'm, I'm very excited to share what I, what the insights I've had and what I've learned. So after thinking about it for a little bit, my first initial idea was, does God need anything from us? What can we possibly give him that he would benefit from? And the truth of the matter is, is that God doesn't need anything from us to increase or sustain his power. And so then why does God require things from us? And then I came up with the idea that the purpose for sacrifice is not for God's sake, but it is for our own, that it's for our own benefit. And that's something really important to understand. And so then with that in mind, what does God ask us to give? What does he ask us to sacrifice? It says in the Book of Mormon, 3 Nephi 9, 20, 22, And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Therefore, whoso repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive. Come unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. So God is asking for our hearts and souls, our commitment and desire to follow him. God wants us to be obedient to his commandments um, because he knows that the only way to find true and everlasting happiness is through those commandments. He asks this so that he can save us. Just as much as we want to be happy on earth, ourselves, our Heavenly Father is in 
heaven now, wanting us to be happy as well. Um, this is what he ultimately wants for us, and this is his goal. God told Moses, um, for this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Uh, he wants his children to be with him again and be happy in eternal exaltation. This is God's, the creator of the universe. This is his only purpose. Um, now, perhaps the coolest part about all of this is that God has made this choice completely up to us. He has given us a plan and given us a straight and narrow. He's given us bodies to experience mortality. He's given us prophets in this dispensation. But most importantly, God has given us the gift of agency because he wants the choice to follow him be completely of our own free will. And unto thy brethren have I said and also given commandment that they should love one another, that they should choose me, their father. To ensure that the choice to follow God was an intentional one, because there is no such thing as accidental followers of Christ. There is only one way to offer our hearts, our broken hearts and souls, like we've been given, or like we've been asked to give. And that one way is only possible through Jesus Christ. Alma says in 38, 9, I've told you this, that you may learn wisdom, that you may learn of me, that there is no other way or means whereby man can be saved, only in and through Christ. Behold, he is the life and light of the world. Behold, he is the word of truth and righteousness. It's because of Jesus Christ and his atonement that we can have that chance to come unto him with our broken hearts. The Savior gives us light. The Savior gives us our life, and that is because that he is life. He is the word of all truth and righteousness. Heavenly Father has given us all the tools we need on this earth to come unto him. Our responsibility and our sacrifice is to choose his ways above any other and follow his gospel. 2 Nephi 10, 23. Therefore, cheer up your hearts and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Given ourselves to God, it is a lot easier said than done, of course. There are so many things that are appealing to the natural man, and Satan has capitalized on that by making them, the things of the world look more enticing than they really are. Um, he distracts us from what God has asked of us. Satan will twist and manipulate the good things in our lives and try to convince us that we can make ourselves happy, that there is an easier way to be happy without having to follow the commandments. But like I said, there is only one way, and it's not negotiable. And so this is where the challenge lies, to put off the natural man. And that can be a hard thing to do, because we can have something, and it can bring us happiness. We can truly love it, and God can say, leave it. I've got something better for you. And because we can't see and understand that, it is a sacrifice. And it can test our faith. This is when Satan works its hardest. To try and convince us that whatever it is that we're doing that keeps us happy, um, that it's okay to keep doing that, and that we can still have joy because we are following most of the rules. But our Father in Heaven needs us to follow all of His commandments. He needs us to keep all of our covenants. He needs us to always honor and trust in Him that there is wisdom in letting those things go. God said in Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your way my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God can see the bigger picture. Unfortunately, we can't. And so we have to exercise faith in Him and His plan for us, trusting that He knows best, that our efforts will be rewarded and we will be blessed. So I'd like to talk about those rewards and blessings now and the witness of our efforts. In Ether chapter 12, 6, it says, Faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. 
Faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because ye see not. For you, ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. And I think that's so important to understand. Dispute not because ye see not. For you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. It can be hard sometimes because we feel like we don't have the happiness that we were promised when we let things go. This also speaks to the fact that knowing the commandments that follow in the commandments tends to take you away from things that offer instant gratification and short happiness. But I can confidently say that I know God does not have anything to do in the realm of instant gratification. But he has everything to do with lasting and eternal happiness. <laughs> wow, sorry guys. <laughs> so do not dispute because you let go of your instant gratification. <laughs> but have faith and trust in God's process. And then you will receive the eternal happiness after the trial of your faith. Again. It's all about trust and faith in the Lord that it will come and that our sacrifices will be met. I'd like to share something that was said at my first MTC devotional. I didn't catch his name, but the uh, non-language learning, the non-language learning director at the MTC said, you cannot place a couple of breadcrumbs on the altar without receiving loaves of bread in return. I instantly wrote that down because I just thought it was such a powerful comment that our efforts are rewarded in full and then some and then some more. He uh, pointed out to all the missionaries, if he can turn a couple breadcrumbs into loaves of bread, what can he do for you after you've dedicated two years of yourself to him? And that really is applicable to everything. Those things that are hard to let go, those little breadcrumbs of happiness, Put those on the altar and let God give you and let God give you loaves of happiness in return. It's kind of a silly analogy, but I hope that you guys understand what I'm trying to say there. Um, the purpose of sacrificing those things isn't to give God what is satisfying us, but it's so that God knows that we have room and that we are worthy to receive his full happiness. And uh, I'd like to share one more thing, something that my companion, Elder Thedell, said after I asked if he had any thoughts on my topic. And uh, he gave a really good answer. And so he said, God requires sacrifice so we can learn. And then he related that sacrifice to the greatest sacrifice that's ever been asked. And that's Jesus Christ performing the atonement in Gethsemane. Dallin H. Oaks called the, ser the, called the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the most transcendent of all events from creation's dawn to the endless ages of eternity. That's a pretty wicked quote. The importance and grandeur of this event is so um, the importance and grandeur of this event is so profound. If this didn't happen, joy and happiness and life would not be possible. But what I find so enduring about this is that even then, God allowed there to be a choice. He did not force Jesus to make that sacrifice for us. It says in Matthew 26, 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, one thing my dad says about this event that just gives me goosebumps every time is that in this moment, when the Savior said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yeah. Meaning, if there's a way that I don't have to do this, can you tell me? And what my dad says about this moment that I love is that all of us, 
were in heaven at that time. And we were all counting on him. <laughs> Sorry. And we were all counting on him to make this choice for us. And all the people that have lived before Christ were count on him, counting on him to redeem the sins that they had already committed. The greatest sacrifice since the creation of existence, one that was prophesied and planned, did not come to pass because of a set destiny, but it came to pass because of a willing choice. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Personally, for me, that just amplifies my love for my Savior. To think that he fully understood what was going to happen to him. And he chose, out of his own accord, to pay for my sins and for all the sins of God's children. Later on in Matthew, verse 42, it says went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Yes, God is going to ask us to give some things that we think we can't give, but that is the trial of our faith. To hold faith in Him and His will, trust in His plan for us and not waver, and we will be blessed for our efforts. And those blessings we receive will profoundly outweigh what we have to give. And that is the gospel paradox. I'm so incredibly excited to give God the next two years of my life. And I can't wait to finally get to Arizona. I know I say that a lot, but I really am just so excited. And start serving the people there. I'm excited to learn all I can from my mission president and my companion and district member members. Um, all my future companions, I can't wait to just start the missionary process. And although I'm excited, there's definitely th things that I'm a lot unsure about and lots of areas where I doubt my capabilities. But I know that by giving everything I have to God and getting lost in the work, I will be able to receive those blessings and overcome those doubts and worries. Brothers and sisters, I'd just like to close by bearing my testimony in this gospel that I know that this gospel is the only way to true happiness. And I know that happiness comes from our devotion to Him I have a testimony in families that I know that they are part of that happiness. And yes, I will miss my family. But I know, dang, sorry guys. But I know that I will miss them even more if I don't do what God has asked me to do. I say all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.